Okay, this teaching is going to be on the trial of Jesus. The trial of Jesus from the time they arrested him all the way through. We're going to see the two, at that time, two of the greatest legal systems, well, the Romans and the Jews. Both of them had a legal system that was, uh, I mean, they, they carried it to the T, both of them, the Romans and the Jews. And we're going to see how these two, how these two, got together and somehow, some way, killed an innocent man. That's what we're, that's what we're going to see. That's what the Lord is going to show us. How they, how this Romans and Jews, how their legal system, and I'm telling you, they, it's, it was there was none better than what they had. The Romans, I mean, they carried everything to the T. Jews were the same way. And somehow, some way, they put Jesus to death. And John... Chapter 8, Jesus stands before the scribes and the Pharisees, which were his major enemies, because they were always trying to put Jesus down. Psalms 35 says that they hated him without cause, and proclaimed to be God in the flesh, the one they'd been waiting on, and here he was, and they hated him. I mean, this, is, this was the Jewish leaders. They'd been waiting... For the Messiah, the Christ, which the Old Testament, that's all it talked about. And that's all they knew was the Old Testament. It was finally in front of their eyes, right before them, and they didn't see him. They hated him without cause. This was prophesied all through the Old Testament. But because they were so tied up in their religious ceremonies, they couldn't see him. The men, now you, you have men like the prophets, like King David... You know, these men love the Lord. They kept their eyes on the Lord. They love the Lord. They, like David, they, they sinned. The Lord showed us that David, I mean, he committed adultery. He murdered. He was a man of God. And God was, you know, God shows us. He's, look, here's a man of God right here, King David. And this is his sins. But David's heart was after God. You know, when we see Christians and they sin, we shouldn't look down at them. We shouldn't look down at them because we're all sinners. We're all sinners. And remember, there is no greater sin, little sin, big sin. And God, in God's eyes, sin is sin. So even though he murdered and committed adultery, he was just a sinner. And God saw him that way, but also God saw his heart. God saw where his heart was. There were so much in their sacraments and all the outward works that they were doing they couldn't see God. God could see their heart, but they couldn't see God. He could see their heart. He knew that these weren't men, like I just said, like David, the prophets. These were men who, they probably started off right, you know, believing in God, reading the uh, the scriptures, the Old Testament. Been just like a lot of preachers today, they start getting off track, and they get a little popularity. They get into tradition, traditions, and before you know it, they're not preaching Jesus anymore. And that's that's the way they were here. We have, I can kind of say, I guess, I did the same thing when I started preaching in the Baptist church. Well, and then I was a young Christian. But the, they saw I was fired up for the Lord, and I loved the scriptures, and I knew the scriptures, and the pastor let me preach when he was gone. And when we had played Bible trivia, people would want me on their side. And Well, this started to get to me. So instead of putting my eyes on the Lord, on the Lord, I put my eyes on knowledge. I got puffed up. And it knocked me down. It knocked me down. I got away with that pride that puffed up because I knew this and people thought I was blah, blah. That glory that I was taking knocked me down. And we have preachers like that today. They take the glory. They don't give the glory to the Lord. And uh, like I said, I'm I'm a testimony of that because that's that's what happened to me. But praise the Lord, He opened my eyes to that. He opened it, my eyes to it, and I make sure that's a thing. I make sure that I don't take no glory. I don't take any glory for myself. I'm standing up here. Don't look at me as friend, husband, 
brother. Just look at me as a Christian that God is using. Remember, God uses our, our lips to speak to us. He says He uses our oracles. And that's all I'm doing. I'm allowing Him to, to speak through me to teach us the Scriptures. Because there's no way I could do this on my own. There ain't no way I can do this on my own. But we have men just like that. Religious men who get puffed up where they're at. Jesus looks at them and says in, in verse 46, Which of you convicted me of sin? And I will say the truth, where do you not believe me? He's saying, he's challenging all the religious leaders, who can convict me of sin? We're in chapter... Well, it's in chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 46. And in 46, like I say, he's challenging the religious leaders, who can convict me of sin? And Jesus says to him, name one sin that I have done so you can justify hating me like you do. This is, he's telling them right here, who, he's challenging them, who convict me, of, who can convict me of a sin? And Jesus says to them, name one sin, just one. That way you can be justified in, in your hatred toward me. And no one said a word. It wasn't because they believed he was sinless. They believed he was a sinner. But it's because they wanted, they didn't want to get trapped by him like times before. Because every time they, they try to put something on Jesus, he always, instead of them trapping Jesus, Jesus ended up embarrassing them. So that's why nobody said anything. And in Luke chapter 20, verses 1 through 8, And it came to pass that one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came unto him with the elders. Now he was preaching the gospel right here in verse 1. In verse 2, And spoke unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority doest thou these things? Or who is he that gave thee this authority? So the religious leaders were asking Jesus, Hey, who told you you can preach? Who told you you can do this? And what they were saying is that, you didn't go to our, our schools. You didn't go to our seminaries. You're not wearing, like, I mean, you watch on TV, you'll see the uh, Jesus of Nazareth and stuff like that. Well, the religious leaders, they all had robes. So it's like, you don't have no robes on, you know, what are you doing? Because the religious leaders, they didn't, they didn't preach or teach in regular street clothes. They all had, the, you know, an outfit to wear. <coughs> he said... What, you know, who's giving you this authority that you can preach the word, the, the scriptures? Who gave you the, the right to say these things? And in verse 3, And he answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Now I'm showing you right here why nobody said anything. When he said, Who can convict me of sin? And nobody said anything. This is why they didn't say anything. Because every time they would say something, Jesus would, Jesus had something to come back on them. And these these verses right here is what I'm showing. And so he, Jesus says, uh, let me ask you a thing and answer me. He says, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? In Luke 7, 38, 30, it says that the religious leaders rejected his baptism. So that's why Jesus is asking them. As he asked them this question. And in verse 28 of Luke 7, For I say unto you, among those that are born of a woman, there is none greater, not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of, of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized. So that's why Jesus asked him this question because they knew that the, they didn't accept John's baptism. I'm just using these verses to show you why Jesus asked him that question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? The elders. The, the, the religious leaders, yeah. So this, and in verse 5 on Luke 20, and they reasoned with themselves saying, if we sell, say, the, the religious leaders are saying right here within themselves, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then believe ye him not? Because John was saying, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But they didn't believe this, and that's what he's saying right here. 
And in verse 6, but if, you, but if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. These leaders didn't accept John as a prophet either. So either way they would have gone, they would have been, it would have been the wrong answer. Now, like I said, I'm pointing this out to show you that's why nobody convicted him of sin at, at that time because of the wisdom of Jesus. They knew every time they asked him a question, he would come back and say, let me ask you a question. And then they couldn't answer it. And in verse 7, and they answered that they could not tell whence it was. So Jesus right here was showing their ignorance. As religious leaders, they couldn't answer that question. And these are... These are religious leaders that God is, that Jesus is speaking to. And they couldn't answer them. In verse 8, And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. He's saying, You don't deserve an answer. Since, since you can't answer me, I'm not going to answer you. Now there was another time, another time the religious leaders tried to trap him. And again, he turns around and, and traps them. In verse 20, further down on that same chapter, verse 22, is it lawful for us, these are the religious, religious leaders again, asking Jesus. They're saying, is it lawful for us to give tribute, meaning taxes, unto Caesar or no? So again, they're trying to trap him. And if he says yes, then they have him. Because it's not, it wasn't a very popular thing among the people to pay taxes. So that right there, if he would have said yes, the people probably would wouldn't have looked at Jesus the way they were looking at him. But if he said no, then they could tell the Roman government, hey, this man is showing disloyalty to Caesar. So this is what they were thinking. If he says yes, we got him here. If he says no, we got him. But Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit, when we, the Holy Spirit gives us the words to say. If we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us, he will, when, when we're put in a situation... The Holy Spirit will take over and give us what we need to say. That's why when I'm witnessing somebody, our church, not the church I go here, but the other church, they had a program. It was called Soul Winning. They would teach people how to witness to people, how to win them to the Lord. They'd give them a program. And my pastor, knowing me, how I was witnessing all the time, he said, why aren't you going to these classes? I know you like to witness. Why aren't you going to these classes? And I told him, and I was a young Christian, and I told him, I said, well, I've always depended on the Holy Spirit to give me the words. I've always just allowed the Holy Spirit to speak. It's never the same. It's not a program follow step one, step two. It's by the Holy Spirit. Luke 12, 11 and 12, it says, and when, they be, and when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take you no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. And this, now I didn't know this at the time. But after reading this verse, I was like, well that's why, I, you know, I don't need no program. The, the Holy Ghost will give me what I need to say. I don't need a step-by-step -step program, you know, A, B. Uh, that's a program. The Bible says, and I've told you over and over, how do you reach people? Is by the Father draws them. And if you're not doing it in the Spirit, if you're doing it, a program is not from the Spirit. A program is from man. You have to allow the Lord to let you just, whatever He puts on you, you say it. And we just got to trust that He'll give us the words. It wasn't long after that, uh, that a girl who took that class came up to me and said, you know, I was witnessing somebody and I was doing that step-by-step -step program that I was taught, but... I just didn't feel right. I, I wanted to say something else, but I went by that program and I told her, I said, listen, don't ever put a program over what the Holy Spirit wants to say. Let the Holy Spirit give you the words. And these are the verses right here that, sh that shows you He will. Now Jesus, after they asked Him this question, Jesus, we look, Jesus was what? He was a carpenter. He was just a plain carpenter. And this carpenter comes back to the religious leaders in verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? They thought they were small enough to trap them. And Jesus says unto them, Who are you to try to trap me? And Jesus says unto them, Why are you trying to trap me? 
He's trying to show them where their hearts are. Why are you doing this to me? And so he says in verse 24, Show me a penny. And he says, Whose image and subscription is had it? And they answered and said, Caesar's. And I'm sure they believed they had him now. Because he didn't know whose image was on the coin. They thought, man, this, this guy don't even know whose image is on the coin. But that's not what Jesus was doing. When he said, whose image is on the coin, he wasn't asking because he didn't know. In verse 25, And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be of God. Now they thought they had him trapped. But this was a pretty simple answer to what they had said. Give your heart to the Lord and give what material thing, like coins, like taxes, to the, to the government. It was that simple. Yeah, it was like taxes. You know, give to the government what belongs to the government, but then give to the Lord to your heart. Yeah. Your heart goes to the Lord, but taxes, we got to obey the government, right? But for some reason, they thought they had them. If, or if he says this, we got them. Or if he says that, we got them. But Jesus came back with an answer, and they were like, and in verse 26, And they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer, and held their peace. See, they couldn't come back with anything to make them look bad in front of the people. So they gave up. And the people were amazed at his answer. After they had failed another group, it says, if you keep reading on down, it says another group of religious leaders came to try to trap them. And they couldn't. And these religious, these religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these were religious leaders. They were like Baptists, Pentecost, Catholic. They were religions that didn't like each other. Well, we believe this way. Well, we believe this. These religions did not like each other. But they joined together. They got together to try to discredit Jesus. That's how much they wanted him out of the picture. I thought there was only one religion there. Roman Catholics didn't come until later. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, at this time, there were Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees. These were, these were the main three religions. Uh-huh. But, and they didn't like each other. Oh. But right here, it says in these, it's just chapter that they got together. Even though they didn't like each other, they got together and tried to trap Jesus, to discredit him. <clears throat> but anyway, what I'm showing here at the question before, who, convict, who can convict me of a sin? And nobody said anything. This is why they were scared to say anything. Because every time they said something, Jesus would show them how dumb they were. I'm showing all this just to show why nobody said anything. Also, in Matthew's chapter 12, you don't have this. I'm just going to read them to you. In chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, I'm not going to read these verses. I'm just going to tell you what it says. He allowed his disciples to pluck corn so they could eat on the Sabbath day. Now, on Sabbath, you ain't supposed to do nothing. That was their tradition. You don't do nothing on Sabbath day. They told him he was breaking the Sabbath. And he told them that King David, which David, they looked up to. The, uh, the religious leader looked up to King David because of who he was. They looked at him as a man of God. And so he said, look at, look at David. Look what he did. The one that looked, like I said, he was the one that the religious leaders all looked up to because of the scriptures. Like I said, they, they knew the Old Testament. They knew all about David. And they lifted up David. And he says how he broke the Sabbath. Now Jesus is telling them how he broke the Sabbath by letting his men go into the house of God. King David let his men go into the house of God and they broke bread, which is only the priests could do. Only the priests could do. But David, King David allowed, allowed his men to go in there and, and break the bread to eat and this is, what, this is what Jesus said to them you're telling me this but you're King David look what he done not only did he tell them that he also told them in verse 8 of chapter 12 that he was Lord of the Sabbath Jesus said that he was Lord of the Sabbath by that statement they should have seen he was proclaiming to be God in the flesh that he was Lord of the Sabbath when he said that again in Luke chapter 13 Verses 10 through 17. Jesus was preaching on the Sabbath day and he saw a woman who had been crippled from an evil spirit. And he called her and healed her. 
from that evil spirit, and she walked and started praising God, the scriptures say. And the religious saw it, and they told him it was wrong for him to be healing on the Sabbath. So you know, the religious dude was like, you don't do nothing on the Sabbath. No kind of work. And Jesus told him, he said, you hypocrites. If you read the New Testament, Jesus, he put it out there. He, I mean, he, he's, this is a carpenter. So they didn't look at him as, as the Messiah or the Christ. Remember that. The, the religious leaders did not look at Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Christ. They looked at him as being a carpenter. And this carpenter told these religious leaders who were very, very highly respected among the people, this carpenter looks at them and he calls them hypocrites. And can you kind of see why these religious are not liking him? <laughs> but every time he says something to them, they can't answer him back. Right. He always puts them on the spot. This carpenter, a carpenter. Not the Son of God, but a carpenter. Because that's the way he looked at him. He said, you take your, act, your ox and your donkey from the barn so they can go drink water on the Sabbath day. That's what y'all do. That's work. And you won't allow me to heal this lady who's, been, who's had this uh, sickness for 18 years. She's been having it for 18 years and you want me to wait till Monday to heal her. When she's been having it all this time and you want me to wait till Monday. But yet you'll take your donkey and your ass and go take them to the river and, so they can drink water. In verse 17 he says... And when, verse 17, further down, he says, And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. Which, mainly his adversary was the religious leaders. He said they were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So the religious leaders, they did not like Jesus. They did not like him. And the people saw him as a carpenter also. Remember all these people that were following him? He was giving. He was giving and they also were, were astonished by his preaching. Luke chapter 4 says they were astonished by his preaching. So not only because he was feeding them, but because of the words he was saying, they were astonished by his preaching. Now remember, try to remember, keep in mind, Jesus is a carpenter. He was not a religious leader. He was not a scribe, a Pharisee, he was none of that. He was just a carpenter. And people were following him. And they would hear him when he when the religious leader did come to them, to him, to try to trap him, they would see that they couldn't. That this carpenter always had something and came back on the religious leaders and he would trap them instead of them trapping him. The Sabbath in the Bible, the Sabbath in the Bible, it means a day of, you know, to rest. We take it, it means a day of worship. Bible doesn't say anything, it's a day of worship. We have put it that way. But there's nowhere in the Bible where it says the Sabbath is a day of worship. If you read the Bible, every day, every day is a day of worship. We should worship the Lord every day. There's not no certain day of a week that we say, okay, on this day we're going to worship the Lord. Christians, true Christians, worship the Lord every day. So Sabbath means it's a day of rest. And the way the church is today, it's hard to rest in the church. You got Sunday school, then you got the uh, the preaching hour, and then they got you back coming back in the in the afternoon. That's not resting. That's not resting. Day of rest is when you rest. You know, the Lord made these bodies, and he he said on the seventh day he rested when God created everything. On the seventh day he rested. wasn't It wasn't that God needed to rest, but He was showing us. On the seventh day, we should rest. He says you can work six days a week, but you need one day to rest. Because he made these bodies. He knows what these bodies can do. So we need one day of rest. And what that day is, is no certain day. It's not a Saturday. It's not. You can make it any day. If you want to make it Saturday, that's fine. You want to make it Sunday, that's fine. But the Sabbath is, is not a certain day in the Bible. Alright? We've done that. So again... They had no one can, to convict them. Because all these things he's, he had already done. And they remembered. And, and that's why they wanted to kill Jesus. These religious leaders weren't healing. Jesus had the power to heal. Why? 
Because everything he did, he did it in the power of his Father. Not in his own power. Remember, Jesus was just a man. Whatever he did, he did it in the power of his Father. Okay? So he was healing. The religious leaders weren't healing people. So he had this big crowd. So are, are we getting a better picture on why there's these religious leaders wanting to put him to death? Here are these men that everybody looks up to because of their robes and their title. They had titles back then. And then here is the carpenter. You know, He doesn't have a Ph.D., but people were astonished at his preaching. He didn't have a Ph.D. He didn't go to college. But people were astonished. Are we... Do, do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, I'm starting to look... Well, this is me. I look at religion like I look at Christmas. The devil has made Christmas the birth of Christ. He's made Christmas into a holiday party gift. Everything you can possibly do to get your eyes off of the Lord. Everything. And he made it, you know, Santa Claus. Oh, you know. Ah, the, all the lights. You know, all the decoration. Every, I mean, he's made it all pretty and everything. To get your eyes away from the Lord. Well, I'm sorry, but I look at religion the same way. We've got so many different religions out there, which that's not of the Lord. And all these religions have certain ways they attract certain people. If people want to feel real holy roly and feel like they're in a holy church where they put statues and stained windows and candles and all that. Or if you got other people who like jumping and screaming and not really, well, we got a church where you can do that too. You know, they, they made churches to fit people. Well, we're going to attract this kind of crowd and that's what they get. We're going to attract this kind of crowd. But there's a church for everybody's personality. But there's only one, one spirit. There's only one. We don't look for a church for our per, the way our personality is. We look for a church where our spirit meets the spirit of the church, of man, the preacher. So, I go to a Baptist church because I'm Baptist? No. I go to a Baptist church because the preacher there is preaching in the spirit. And my spirit receives it. And that's why I go there. But I can go to a Pentecostal church. If the preacher is preaching in the spirit, I can go there. I am not going to a church just because my personality fits that church. Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to go where, the, where there's a man of God preaching in the spirit. That's where we're supposed to go. So instead of these, these religious leaders, instead of falling on their knees and recognizing who Jesus was, they wanted to kill him. And one of the reasons they wanted to kill him was because of what it says in Matthew chapter 23. Jesus is speaking to the crowds and his disciples. And he tells them in chapter 23 of Matthew. He tells them the, relig the religious leaders are preaching the law of Moses. So obey what they preach because they're preaching the scriptures, the law of Moses. Okay, So Jesus is telling them Ob obey what they're preaching. But, do, but don't do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. This is what Jesus is telling the people. Now remember, the, the religious leaders, they know this. They're hearing this. And when Jesus says, hey, listen to them, but don't do as they do. Because they don't practice what they preach. They give heavy religious demands. Now this is all in chapter 23 of uh, Matthews, if you want to read them. I'm just going to explain them to you. But they give heavy religious demands, but they're not going to do anything to help you with them. Everything they do is for show. Everything those religious did, religious leaders did, was for show. They wore the long robes. Did Jesus have a long robe? He didn't have no outfit. They had outfits. They would sit at the head of the tables at banquets. You know, look who I am. I'm sitting at the head. They sit in the seats of honor in the churches. We see that all the time. They got churches like that one over there where they got these seats with a high back and they're sitting up there on stage with their nice silk suits on. They accept the praises from people. They accept, they accept praises from the people. Now these, this is religious leaders. They love the titles they have as rabbi, which meaning teacher, or being called father. We only have one spiritual teacher, and we only have one. Sp I'm a I'm a teacher, but the Lord is the one teaching me to, to y'all. It's not that I am a teacher. 
Well, let me put it this way. I'm not the teacher. I am a teacher. Do you understand? I'm not the teacher. Jesus is the teacher. I'm just a teacher. But they have, he says, hey, there's only one spiritual teacher and there's only one heavenly father, spiritual father. In uh, Matthew 23, 9, it says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. That's what he says. But yet we have religious churches that have the title father. We have men who are, have the title as reverend. You know, there's none reverend. There's only one reverend, that was Jesus. Reverend means without sin, holy, perfect. Yeah, the Lord says we're all brothers and sisters. We're all brothers and sisters, all of us. There's no man that's my spiritual father because he is a brother. Any, any Christian out there, and no matter if he's a priest, a pastor, whatever, it's a brother. He's my brother. That's what in, in Jesus' eyes. But the world, we have, we have titles of these like I said, reverend, and, and, and other titles that they take on, which we should not have these titles. We shouldn't have these. These titles belong to the Lord, Father, Reverend. These all belong to the Lord. We have to watch out for these false prophets and preachers and teachers. Listen to what it says in De Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams... I give it thee, or give it thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods. Now, this is meaning anyone who's leading you to other gods. If they're leading you to worship anything else but the Lord. This is what's talking about going after other gods. Or even praying to, uh, to whatever. That's leading you after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Verse 3, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, this preacher who is doing this, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, which means he's testing you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart or with all, and with all your soul. So he's saying there's going to be men out there who are going to try to lead you away from from heavenly father from in heaven onto other gods and there's in this world there are gods all over the place there's I mean they got religion the devil is their god and they'll say it devil worshippers and they'll say I'm a devil worshipper but then they got religious churches people who are they say they that god they believe in god but yet they worship other things or other people. Right here the Lord says, Hey, I'm going to test you. I'm going to see if you're going to follow that or if your heart and your soul belongs to me. That's what he's saying right here. Verse 4, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. And you shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And that prophet or dreamer shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. Like I say, any, any religion that is pointing to anything else besides the Lord God in heaven, Jehovah God, he's saying right here, they'll be put to death for doing that. Also in, in Matthew seven twenty two, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And he says, what, what's he going to say to them? He's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. So we got we got religious leaders and Christians who are out there saying, Lord, Lord, you know, all religious, this religious talking. And at the end, God's going to say, hey, depart from me. I never knew you. He said that those who have leadership titles, those who are in leadership like pastors and deacons, he said they should be our servants. Not up here. Like in some churches, they, they think they're like I said, they got those silk suits on. They sit on these high back chairs on top of the stage, like they're really something. The Bible says those men are our servants. They don't act. They don't look like, and they don't act like servants to me. This is the word of God. All right. This is what He says they are. Those who are proud, the ones who try to impress, impress you with their titles, but He says they're ignorant, and He'll put them in their place. The ones who are humble, He said they will be lifted up. 
He says many times in this chapter, Woe, woe unto you religious leaders, you hypocrites. In, the chapter, in this chapter, several times he said, Woe unto you. When God says, Woe unto you, when God says that, and when He calls you a hypocrite, and He says that to the religious leaders several times in this chapter, you don't want to be the one that He's saying that to. They preach different ways of getting to heaven, and He says, and they won't be making it themselves. They go out as missionaries to other countries to get people to follow their beliefs, which we have a lot of missionaries out there. we got this country sending missionaries to other countries, but then other countries are sending their missionaries over here. So everybody's got missionaries trying to follow their beliefs. Everybody, everybody's doing it. He also calls them blind guides. He calls them hypocrites and he calls them blind guides. Who's he talking to? Religious leaders. This, this is the religious leaders he is addressing. He's called them hip, he's a woe unto you. He's called them hypocrites and, and he's also called them blind guides. You're leading the people in the wrong direction. He says, he says to them, you tithe to the very penny, but you have ignored the most important part of, of being a Christian. He says, you make clean the inside. I mean, at the outside, you look all clean with your robes and your, the way you act. But the inside of you, he said, you have dead men's bones. It means you're not born again. It means you're not a Christian. That's why, that's why we need to search the scriptures, right? Because we don't know who these dead men's bones are. Because they look like us. They look like religious people, religious leaders. They look like it. But inside they're dead men's bones. That's what the, the Lord says. He says, make clean the, the, he said, make clean the outside by making clean the inside. He said, get your heart right. Then you'll look clean on the outside. And you're not, he's not talking about what you wear either. Get your heart clean on the inside. Then that will make you clean on the outside. Now also in the same chapter further down, he, he's not finished calling them names. <laughs> he calls them vipers. He says, you snakes and vipers. Now this is Jesus speaking. Now if we hear somebody today go to some religious leaders and call them hypocrites, you snake, you viper, we're going to think that person is the devil. Huh? Are we? If we see a man, now remember this is a carpenter speaking. If we see a man going up to a religious leader and saying, You hypocrite, you're a snake, you're a viper, you're a blind guide, are we going to look at this man as being holy? No. <laughs> no, we're not. We're going to think, Man, this is the devil. But what's Jesus doing here? He's showing us because these men on the outside look religious, and the one who's doing it, Jesus here, He's just a regular looking man. He's just a regular looking guy. Nothing fancy about him. He was a carpenter. He didn't have no titles. Pastor, preacher, priest, whatever you want to say it. He had no titles. But he's the one that's calling the religious leaders those names. So today, we have it backwards. We look at the religious leaders as being religious leaders and we can't touch them. Because they're here and we're here. Remember, God is no respecter of person. Nobody, nobody is here and the others are here. Okay. In God's eyes, we're all equal. We're all equal. He says that he sent the prophets and wise men to teach and they ended up killing them. They did. They killed a lot of prophets. The religious, he's told me, now he's addressing the religious leaders here. And he tells them these things. He says that they're accountable for murdering godly men. He said, they're going to be accountable for killing these men. He says, he also tells them, he says, I will tell you the truth, that judgment will fall on you. These men have it coming. When he says, woe unto you, you got it coming. And in verse 38, he tells them, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Your house. He's calling the house of God, the temple, right here in verse 38, and he's talking to the religious leaders, Behold, your house. He didn't say God's house. He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, it says, And Jesus said unto them, It is written, My house, meaning God's house, the temple, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. He said, Your house. This was God's house, but now he's saying, Your house. 
because they've they've made it into a house of den of thieves. They have. You know these these people that were in there selling. You know, like today, you know, vendors. Like like if you go to a store, the store has to give you permission if you want to sell something in there, right? And if they say yes, you can sell this in there. Well, are they going to get part of what you make? Huh? They're going to make money, right? Well, guess what? When Jesus did that, the religious leaders, the religious leaders, had to give these vendors permissions to do what they to sell what they wanted to sell in there. And guess what? They were getting a profit. So now they're affecting the religious leaders by their pocket, in their pocket. And you know what money means. It means the same thing back then as it does now. So Jesus is saying, hey, your house is no longer God's house. It's your house. He says, since you have rejected me, you will not see me again until you recognize me as the Messiah. And that's not going to be until the tribulations because the Jews will not recognize Jesus as the Messiah until the tribulation. But he says right now, right here, he says, you will not see me again until you recognize me as the Christ. And it's true. It's true what he said here. And they won't. The Jews will not recognize Jesus as the Christ until the tribulation. So they're not going to see him until the tribulation. The Jews. Now that you have a pretty good picture of what they wanted, why they wanted to get rid of Jesus, Jesus I mean, he was affecting them all kind of way. In their pocket, their, their, their statue as men. You know, people looked up to them. Now they're looking at Jesus. They didn't like none. They didn't like nothing Jesus was doing. No wonder they wanted to kill him. <laughs> John chapter 18, verse 12 through 14. Then the band and the captain and officers. Now this is when they came to arrest Jesus that night. It says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. And led him away to Annas, Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So we had the officers in the band, which was soldiers, who, who came to arrest Jesus. It wasn't the Romans. Okay, remember that. It wasn't the Romans who arrested Jesus. It was the Jews. All right? They arrested him. And all four, uh, uh, in Matthews, Mark, Luke, and John, they never told Jesus why he was being arrested. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all say pretty much the same thing. Okay, but if you read all four of them on this account where they went to arrest Jesus, none of them, none of them said that they were telling Jesus why he was being arrested. They just took him. It was like a SWAT today. It's like they came after him with SWAT because in the Bible it says they came with swords and spears to arrest him. And, and like, he was an innocent man. They came and arrested him with all these, like a SWAT team, and then they didn't even tell him why they were arresting him. We also need here, when we read this in the Bible, we need to see the patience, the patience, the patience, and the weakness of Jesus. Did he fight and say, "Hey, what are you doing? Why are you arresting me? What's you know what's the cause?" He didn't. He didn't say none of that. They came for him and he went. Are we like that? Do we have the patience of Jesus? Do we have the meekness of Jesus? Are we supposed to? Blessed are the meek. So if we, if we be this way, we're going to be blessed. If we can be like Jesus, Christian, we will be blessed. But right here, I mean, I mean, like, like today, if a, if, a, if a tank SWAT team came into this, to this house over here to arrest me, and all these policemen, whatever, I'm like, aren't you going to say, hey, what's, you know, what, why are you doing? What are you doing? Jesus didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. This, right here, this was the beginning of his illegal arrest. It was illegal for him to arrest, uh, for them to arrest him. And the trial, which that's is one of the things I'm going to point out. His arrest was illegal, and we're going to see that his trial was illegal. Caiaphas was the high priest at that time, but they took Jesus to Annas, who was the high priest. Remember, he's the one, one of the ones that Jesus affected the pocketbook. The ones they took Jesus to, he was one of the religious leaders that he affected the pocketbook. You know, money, like I said, just like money today, money was the same thing back then. 
it's pretty powerful. You take money away from somebody, they're going to get back at you. Now we're going to drop down to verse 19. The high priest then asked Jesus of, of his disciples and of his doctrine. They said, tell me about your disciples and of your teachings. That's what they're saying to Jesus. And in verse, G, verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. So Jesus is showing, hey, I didn't hide anything from you. My, all my preaching was out in the open. It was in the churches. It was out in the open. I haven't hid anything from you. Because what he did was all from the Father. Now let me just say this real quick. Just a little, short little, quick rabbit trail here. We have, right here where it says, And in secret have I said nothing? Jesus is saying, I have no secrets. I have no secrets. We have religions, organizations today, where men in these religions and organizations have secrets. They take oaths and they have secrets. And I'm going to say the name of one of them. So whoever's listening to this CD, if it affects you, repent. That's all I got to say. But the Masons, who are very highly thought of how much... They do a lot of help. They do... I mean, they help the churches. They, they're always helping people. The Masons. But if you read the book, The God Makers, it talks not only about the Masons, but it's others. But the, there's a book called The God Makers. And it talks about the Masons. May, the men in the Mason Masonic Lodge, they have to take oaths and make secrets that they won't do this or do that. Because if they do, and this is an oath they take, they can do away with them. What do you mean do away with them? Kill them. I mean, that's how serious it is. The brothers, the in the... Like the same Masons will kill the other Masons who... Yeah. I mean, they take an oath that they will not reveal these secrets. And it's not just the Masons, it's your others. But if you don't believe me... KC's, I mean, I don't know about the killing, but the KC's also... Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. There's religions and organizations. I'm just pointing out to the Masons. But if you don't believe me, get the book. And it, 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 the book's been out for a long time. It's called The God Makers. And it'll tell you exactly what I'm saying right now. But I'm just, what I'm trying to show you, with Christians, there are no secrets. We don't have secrets. These men make secrets. They had to take oaths. And they keep these secrets from their wives. What does the Lord says? The husband and wife become what? One. one. Are we supposed to keep secrets from each other? If you're one with somebody, you have no secrets. But these men take an oath to not even tell their wives of some of the things they believe in. Well, we, the people, we look at these places, these organizations as, you know, they help people with this, they help people with that. I mean, they do a lot of help them. But I have to go back to the, to, the, to the verse that says, It doesn't matter how good you are. The Lord says, It don't matter how good you are. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you're wicked. So we have good moral people. Moral people. We have good moral people. Not Christians. Moral people. People who will take the shirt off their back to help you. And organizations. But that doesn't mean they're right with God. We look at them. The world looks at them that way. In fact, I mean, whoever's listening to the CD, I might have had some people cut it off already because I've, I've said this. But it's the Word of God. The, ver the, the Scriptures say He told Paul to give all the counsel of the Word of God. All, all of it. So I don't hold nothing back. And when the, when the Lord says, I have no secrets, then i got to point out to you, hey, we have churches and organizations that have secrets. They seem good. They look good. But you're just like a wolf. They look good. They speak good. But they're wolves. Same thing. Get the book, The God Makers. You'll have to ask for it because I don't think it's still in the store. But just go to any bookstore and say you want the book called The God Makers. And uh, it'll tell you all about it. And believe me, and the reason I mainly pointed out the Masons because the Masons are a pretty big organization. And people really look up to them. That's my little rabbit trail. Now back, verse, <laughs> verse 21. Why asked thou me, Jesus saying, why are you asking me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. Jesus saying, why are you asking me? 
Ask my accusers, he said. In the Bible, in the Scriptures, when you take someone to court, the, the Scriptures tell you how to do it. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, it says, at, now this is, when you take someone to court, this is the way you're supposed to do it. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. So what the verse is saying here, if you have two or three witnesses saying that you did whatever, you can be put to death. But he says, if there's only one witness, if, there, if you only have one witness, then they can't put you to death. Because one witness is not enough to, to prove somebody has done wrong. Also in Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 19, verse 15, you must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony, testimony of two or three witnesses. It says it again. So right here the Lord showing you, the scriptures are showing us, when you take someone to court, you better have two or more witnesses to prove what you're trying to prove. He said, if you, he's saying right here, if you only got one, that's not going to do it. This is God's way. I mean, this is the scriptures right here. Well, our justice system has no justice to it. So, but this is the Lord's way. This is the Lord's way, and the, and the Lord, He didn't put people in prison for years and years and years. In the Bible, if a man raped a woman, he was killed right there. I mean, as soon as he was convicted, they killed him right there. They didn't put him in prison for a year, two years, five years. He was killed. He could appeal. He could. So our Lord's justice system. If we was to live by His justice system, we wouldn't have nowhere near the crime we have now. But right here, I'm just showing you, because they brought, Je they didn't even tell Jesus why He was being arrested. And right here, it's saying, okay, when you arrest somebody, you better have some witnesses. To, whatever you're convicting this person of, you better have some witnesses. And verse 22, And when He had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of His hand, saying, Answer thou the high priest. This was illegal. This was legal, illegal also. Acts 23, verses 1 th through 3. It says, And Paul, they arrested Paul. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, now he's talking to the council, the religious leaders, the judges. He says, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So Paul is saying, Hey, I have lived for the Lord. I have been... More, he was saying more or less he's saying I have been a good man I live for the Lord I am a Christian that's more or less what he was saying verse 2 and the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth okay they did Paul the same way then in verse 3 then said Paul unto him God shall smite thee thou whited wall for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and to command me to be smitten contrary to the law. So it's contrary to the law, that's what he said. It's contrary to the law that you strike me. He's saying right this right here. So if it was contrary to the law to, to hit Paul, then the same thing goes for Jesus. It was against the law for him to strike Paul. It was also against the law for them to strike Jesus. Now I'm going to read, now verse 3 that I just read, I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible. God will, and Paul says to this, but I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? And this is the way the Living Bible says it. So Paul's saying, hypocrite, it's going to come back on you, right? Up here, it says, thou white water. Well, it's kind of like you're, you're, you're a corrupt hypocrite. Is what he's saying. But what I'm trying to show here, they were illegal by striking Jesus. They couldn't strike him. They they were illegal by doing that. In verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smacketh thou me? Jesus is saying, If I have done anything, show me. He says, Show me. Where are the witnesses? He says, Show me. Why are you hitting me? Okay? So Jesus is saying, you're, you're, he's accusing the judges right here. You're giving me an illegal trial. And then God... He didn't have any, any witnesses there too. Huh? He didn't have no witnesses. He kept saying that. Yeah. And in God's law, 
that every man will have justice when he goes to court. That's in God's law. Deuteronomy 25.1, it says, If there be a, a controversy between men, like if there's two men and one man takes another to court, it says, And they come unto judgment to court, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So if you take someone to court, if you're wrong, you're going to be condemned. Okay, but if you're if you're not wrong, if you if you're not proven wrong, then you're going to be justified as being righteous. Okay, so what he's saying, God is saying, he, he gives justice in His court system. If you're wrong, give me two or three witnesses, so it can be proven. If you only have one, you can't prove anything. This is God's way. And in Acts four three, and they laid hands on them and put them in the hole until the next day, for it was not eve time. I read that verse to show another illegal thing they did. Right here it says they, they arrested someone and said to put them on hold till the next day. Because it was night time. You can't have court at night. We don't have court at night today. All of our courts are open during the day. But even it was even that way back then. They arrested someone in Acts 4.3 and it says to hold them till the next day. Because you can't try them at night. So what I've taught so far, that the trial... That first they arrested him without charge. They arrested him and they didn't even tell him why he was being arrested. That was the first thing they did illegal. The second thing they did illegal was they brought no witnesses. I just read you the scriptures from the Old Testament the way God has it. If you bring someone to court, you better bring two or three witnesses. He says if you only got one, you ain't got nothing. So they didn't bring any. And then the third, third way they, it was illegal, like I just read, they judged them. They brought them at night. They didn't wait. They didn't hold them until the next day like they did up here in Acts 4.3. They judged them. They put them on trial that night. So, so far through the teaching, there's three illegal things they've done already. And I'm not even, I'm not even halfway through the teaching yet. So, they, and this is just the first, this is the first night. This is just the first night. There's a whole lot more. I mean, we got a whole lot more. This teaching is going to show how two courts killed an innocent man. Two of them. The Jewish laws, courts, and the Roman courts. Both of them. And these were laws, these were courts that held everything to the T. And everything they did with Jesus was illegal. And that's what I'm going to be showing.